Television is a perfect medium for comic book adaptations, and the last few years have seen an absolute explosion of comic book properties, from the CW's pantheon of DC shows to Netflix's own Marvel entries. If, like me, you love this kind of stuff, you've got almost too much to choose from. But there's one show in particular, living in the corner of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that I will stand by as one of the absolute best. Of course, I am talking about Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Sorry, that corner was really dark and I couldn't help myself. The show has always had an impression as being nothing but a tie-in to the movies. It stars Agent Coulson after his apparent death in the Avengers, it visits the aftermath of Thor's battle in the Dark World and deals with the Winter Soldier's big twist, and sets up the appearance of S.H.I.E.L.D. in Age of Ultron, just to name a few. Being seen as the tie-in show isn't that hard compared to the Netflix series, considering how much they go out of their way to avoid mentioning any Avengers by name. So go after the big green guy, the flag waver, I wasn't even there! I could talk at length about all the things I love about S.H.I.E.L.D., but there are two aspects in particular that any other comic book show can and should learn from, being structure and character. That sounds vague and or obvious, but it'll make more sense in a few minutes I hope. There's inevitably going to be some level of spoilers for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to follow, though we will keep them as minimal and vague as possible. Join S.H.I.E.L.D., travel to exotic, distant lands, meet exciting, unusual people, and kill them. Most comic book shows at the moment, such as Arrow, The Flash, or Supergirl, have a certain formula. Somewhere between 18 to 22 episodes with one big bad that is introduced quite early on, and who the heroes spend the bulk of the season fighting against. And for the most part, that's fine. Supergirl's reign and Arrow's Prometheus use their screen time pretty well to better develop and establish the characters and their relationship to the heroes. But with S.H.I.E.L.D., the creative team took a different approach to the season structure, which was most noticeable in the show's standout fourth season. Rather than one long fight against a single big antagonist, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. splits its seasons into mini-arcs, or as they were known in season four, pods. Each pod has its own distinct theme, story, and overall flavor, is reasonably self-contained, and typically has a suitable conclusion that happens to set up and flow directly into the next arc. Splitting the season up into smaller pods makes each one feel fresh, and gives a much more kinetic and dynamic feel to the overall season. Every episode has the freedom to push the story forwards, without having to worry about maintaining the status quo, and it doesn't have to wait for important episodes like finales for major actions and resolutions to happen. It gets fans coming back for the next episode, because solving mysteries and getting answers to our many questions is super satisfying. And with this model, the audience gets to experience that feeling for more than just the big episodes. There's nothing wrong at all with slow-burning stories and concept, but in its own way, this style of writing actually gives the writers a lot of freedom to have their slower, character-based moments as well. In a long season with a single story, things are at risk of feeling dragged out if not paced correctly, and something like a bottle episode can drag the story to a halt. With TV, we generally only get one episode a week, and so a few slower episodes in a row can make the audience feel as though nothing has been happening for ages, even if it's really only been a few weeks. This isn't so much a problem in binging, with shows that are released all at once, but on a regular schedule it's natural that viewers want to get to the meat of things in a timely manner. It's why the second season of The Walking Dead was considered brutally slow during its initial airing, but runs much better when viewed all at once. So with a structure like Shields, the slower episodes and character moments can nestle in nicely alongside the overall faster pace, functioning as breathers rather than speed bumps. One of the best examples of this is Season 3's 4722 hours, which primarily features only two characters, and is easily one of the series' strongest episodes. It's a simple, quiet step away from the bigger arcs of the season so far, a straightforward story of survival and companionship. But beyond being such a small and personal episode, it still manages to add plenty to the rest of the season around it. There's also an inevitable problem with longer burning conflicts that the big villain can't be defeated until the finale. So with every time the heroes fight, the audience knows that either they have to lose or their victory will only be temporary. But when the story is split up, it's suddenly much easier to invest in the fight and the action because it's possible for the heroes to win without meeting the end of the story. But this story can only be as good as its characters, and many will agree that this is the core strength of the MCU in general. People will continue to get their butts into theatre seats because they love Tony Stark, they love Steve Rogers, and of course, Hawkeye. 
These were characters relatively unknown to the general audience when the MCU first began, since Fox and Sony held the rights to Marvel's most recognisable heroes like Wolverine and Spider-Man, so Marvel had no choice but to make genuinely good films and characters since they wouldn't get by on name alone. S.H.I.E.L.D. started in a similar place. Even as the Avengers were becoming household names, this little series only had access to one small name, Agent Phil Coulson, so the show could only go so far on name recognition. Making these characters into people the audience would keep tuning in to see was something that needed to happen for S.H.I.E.L.D. to succeed, and a big part of this was always allowing them to evolve. Change is one of the most important aspects to a good, compelling story, and nothing can kill a narrative like stagnation. Right from the moment the Winter Soldier dropped, S.H.I.E.L.D. has been totally unafraid of allowing a character to change. The writers at first created a team full of common archetypes like the silent badass, the boy scout, the science nerds and the smart mouth hacker, and then completely transformed them. Every member of the cast gets put through events that leave them permanently altered, and they never, ever go backwards. No character is exempt from the way S.H.I.E.L.D. forces them to grow, by constantly taking things away from them, big or small, but always something integral to that character. This goes for the overarching plots as well, never letting the team get too safe or comfortable, and never allowing things to stay the same for too long, which goes back to the strength of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s mini arcs. In combination, the shorter arcs allow for more opportunities to push the characters, because everything is allowed to change without having to be reset. A character who struggles is much more interesting and engaging than one who is content and in control, and this next part of the discussion will contain bigger spoilers for the first two seasons of S.H.I.E.L.D. So pop along to the timecode on screen now if you want to avoid them. Okay, the most obvious and perhaps best example of character change is Fitz, portrayed by Ian DeCastica, the lab geek tech specialist, young, socially awkward and completely inexperienced in the field, your standard tech guy character. He has three things at the start of the show that are the core of his initial character. His brilliant mind, his trust in S.H.I.E.L.D. and his team, and his close friendship with Simmons. So, one by one, these things are taken away or changed. S.H.I.E.L.D.'s infiltration by Hydra cuts him deep, especially when Ward, his teammate and friend, is revealed as a traitor as well. Ward dropping him to the ocean caused him to suffer oxygen deprivation and develop aphasia, cutting him off from his most defining asset and his primary way of contributing to the team, his mind. In turn, the events in the change cause a rift with Simmons, depriving him of his best friend when he needs her the most. The show takes his brain damage seriously, giving DeCastica plenty of opportunities to act the hell out of the character. Do you, do you, do you, do you know what the, um... What you... Okay. I... No, I have trouble with words, so, um... It's probably best that I show you. Show me what? Hypoxia. I found that one. That's what you did to me. And despite all the hard work Fitz puts into recovery, and all the progress he makes throughout the series, he never returns to who he was before. Fitz is fundamentally changed. Ideally, this explains what I mean about these two aspects of the show being so important to the strength of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's still so overlooked compared to the movies and even the Netflix shows, and I don't believe that's fair even as I understand why. Iron Man and Daredevil have bigger name appeals than Phil Coulson for a start, but the idea of looking at the show as a simple tie-in does a great disservice to it, which exists as much, much more than just a supplementary series. While it clearly lives in the same world as the Avengers and is sure to remind you of that, it also has its own story to tell, and from the Winter Soldier onwards, that story has been a constant ride. The shorter arcs keep the seasons fresh and dynamic, but still allow for opportunities to push the characters because the story is allowed to change without having to worry about sticking to the status quo. S.H.I.E.L.D. has taken risks in its storytelling, and in doing so has learned to tell a great one, in a way that other shows should absolutely look to and learn from. Don't touch Lola. 